Coming up on the live and interactive AXA legislative lunch break, Megan and I will get you all of your latest news and information from the state capitol. Plus, we are talking about early transitional kindergarten. Two school districts implemented a program, and now they're being fined for it. We'll talk to the district leaders about what's happening with their program and what they've heard from the state. The AXA legislative lunch break starts now. And it's a couple of minutes after one o'clock. We welcome you on a Wednesday to the live and interactive AXA legislative lunch break. I'm Naj Alakan, AXA's Senior Director of Marketing and Communications with us today in the co-host chair, Megan Baer, our AXA legislative advocate. Megan, this is becoming a habit. You, you are now in that chair. We're just going to have to completely dress up your office now. I'm ready. If Edgar <laughs> keeps traveling everywhere, then, you know, I... I guess I keep having to fill in. I Well, you keep having to fill in, or we're just very excited to have you here with us today. Yes, Edgar uh, is traveling around the country. We'll show you where he is uh, in just a second. Neri is our very first one uh, on the chat today, followed by Lester Powell and Gail Olson. Uh, good to have you guys here. We talked about Edgar. Uh, for those of you who may not know, we are just wrapping up our AXA CSBA Coast to Coast Conference. This is our federal advocacy trip that's been going on in Washington, D.C. We've got some photos to show you because, as as we mentioned, uh, Edgar not in the co-host seat today, um, but Edgar and uh, dozens of superintendents along with uh, board members had the opportunity to be in D.C. for some federal advocacy. You can see uh, acts of president-elect Rafael Placencia, our vice president, Daryl Camp, and Ivan Carrillo from our governmental relations department meeting with uh, Senator Butler from the state of California. And then I believe we have another one. Yes, that's Alex Padilla, uh, the senator in with our same group. I see uh, Dr. Gina Potter in there as well. And then uh, Nancy Pelosi joining our group as well. So a really, really great trip there in Washington, D.C., Megan. I can't wait to hear um, Edgar's reflections when we come back. Uh, currently in a plane, en route, we thought, yeah, let's again test out that Southwest Wi-Fi. Let's see how <laughs> it works. But I think that I think we've decided it's probably best that we don't do that. Probably best. Um, let's do some news headlines. And Megan, I'm going to ask for your insight on one particular thing. But first off, let's talk about chronic absenteeism. We've talked about it a lot here on this show. There's an interactive map right now on EdSource that we encourage you to go take a look at after our show is done. Um, it, it shows, it reflects really a, that data point that we talked about um, right now, about a third of the nearly 1,000 school districts here in the state of California are reporting a higher rate of chronic absenteeism in the 2022-23 school year as compared to before. So go ahead and take a look at that. Um, also, bills are popping up. And Megan, this is what I'll bring you back on to just kind of get your sense of this time of year inside of the state capitol. A um, lot of bills moving through the legislature right now. Um, a couple of bills are out there that people can read about. I mean, they can read about all of them, but there are some interesting ones. Uh, we talked with Senator Josh Becker last week. He said there are 35 bills related to artificial intelligence inside the state capitol right now. I know you have been going to the state capitol a number of times, as everyone in our governmental relations department has, to go and, and listen in on the conversations, participate in those conversations about bills. What is this time like inside the state capitol? Well, I came from over there this morning. There's um, thousands of people in the building right now, lobbying, folks lobbying, advocacy groups working, um, legislators running from hearing to hearing and meeting. So it is incredibly crowded um, and busy. We had a budget hearing this morning to pass some early action proposals um, that's going to make some of the governor's initial cuts, not too many to education. They're reducing funding to facilities program as we expected, but um, we'll see more on that soon, too. Um, I also want to bring this up um, about FAFSA. Um, this is a story that that I, I think is really important for so many of us to focus on right now. The deadline for students to 
uh, put in their FAFSA registration forms has been extended to May 2nd uh, by the California legislature. And here's the reason why. Only about 40% of the high school seniors here in the state of California have submitted those FAFSA uh, applications. Next week is FAFSA week in action, and the White House has uh, several suggestions for getting uh, the kids to fill out their forms. So go to the FAFSA website now for some of those suggestions. Okay, let's switch topics, Megan. Um, you and I met earlier this week. Um, you handed me a couple of weeks ago this great document here from the suburban school districts. Um, so let me lay out here, and then you can tell me, Nod, you're, you're wrong. You got that detail wrong, and then we can bring in our guests and they can make fun of me for it. Um, so in early 2021, uh, the state put together a five-year timeline to expand transitional kindergarten by several months each year until 2025-26, when all four-year-olds uh, would have the opportunity to enroll in TK. Many districts moved quickly, prepare facilities, uh, develop staffing plans, train educators uh, to implement TK along the state's timeline. We know that the governor has really been pushing for a lot of this early education. The districts began engaging their school communities, and they found that many families had the desire to move their kids into the transitional kindergarten um, time, but their birth dates fell a little bit out of the window. So the districts uh, were told uh, that they could enroll children, but they would not receive the attendance funding uh, to serve them. The two school districts that we are going to talk about today, Garden Grove and Downey, uh, where they have an unduplicated student population of 81% and 73% respectively, launched their programs. But under a state law, and this is where you hooked me into this story, Megan, under a state law that was implemented last July, after the districts put together these programs, uh, a state law was implemented about class sizes and adult to teacher ratios that didn't match up with what these two school districts had planned. So now under this law that imposes fiscal penalties, Garden Grove is being fined an estimated $3.2 million and Downey is being fined an estimated $1 million. So we wanted to talk about it. I got all of those facts correct, right? So many facts. So yes, um, we have our wonderful superintendents that are going to join us, but they decided to embrace transitional kindergarten, enroll as many children as they could, even outside eligibility windows. They're now facing audit penalties because the rules of the program changed a few weeks before the start of this current school year. So um, I know they're going to tell their stories much better than we can, but yes, I mean, they find themselves in quite a very difficult situation. Yeah. So let's go ahead and bring them on. Dr. John Garcia is the superintendent from Downey Unified School District and Dr. Gabriella Moffey, superintendent, Garden Grove Unified School District. Uh, Gabrielle and John, it's great to have you here on the AXA legislative lunch break. Welcome. Uh, let's just start with the why. Uh, why did you both choose to launch this early transitional kindergarten program in your district, uh, especially since they're not required uh, and they aren't funded? Uh, Gabriella, we'll start with you. Sure. A few simple reasons. Number one, UTK or transitional kindergarten has always been a challenge. You're like, you only have four months worth of children. So our kindergarten teachers will get some students who had TK and some that had it. We surveyed our parents when we found out that the state was going to extend it to a full year's worth of children, which was really exciting for us. We're in a district, 81% unduplicated account, 79% free and reduced lunch. So in our local area, very similar to John's, we have very few options for high poverty families to have full day care in preschool. They're either with an abuelito or abuelita, they're um, at home with a, a group of other kids and the parent can't work, or we have a three hour state preschool. I could not hold a job and have my child only in school for three hours. So we heard from our parents that they really wanted their children to be able to participate and for us to accelerate the timeline, which we plan to do in a two-year timeline versus a four-year timeline. And we also heard from our kindergarten teachers who were like, please, please, please let us get a full class of kindergartners who have all had transitional kindergarten because they saw the benefit of it. And John. Yeah, I don't know that I would say anything different uh, from Gabriella Naj. I mean, I think that kind of uh, really hits the nail on the head. And, and quite frankly, in districts ours with high and duplicated counts, et cetera, 
what a great service, what a great opportunity, not only to get a head start academically uh, for those students that we only used to be able to get September 2nd through December 2nd, but to get those students started, but what a great opportunity for our community to be able to have their students a part of our full day uh, program earlier and those kindergarten teachers really pushing for us to say, hey, what a great head start. Some kids are getting 14 years of school. Some are only getting 13. So this is going to close the gap. What a great opportunity to get the, the, the head start going. So really the combination of, you know, our kindergarten teachers saying what a great opportunity. And number two is providing that opportunity to our community. Uh, we're really strong drivers behind this. And we understood about the ADA implications, not worried about that because this is the right thing to do by our communities. And that's what they're asking us to do. So the budget trailer bill that we talked about that went into effect right before the start of this school year imposes significant penalties if you don't abide by these changed rules. What do the fiscal penalties look like in your districts and how is this gonna impact students in the classroom? Gabriella, uh, Gabriella. Uh, you want me to go first? So. So uh, for us, we've got about 70 students who are between June the 3rd and June the 30th. So to your earlier point, Nash, when you went over the document, mm -hmm. we had always understood the end of the school year to be June the 30th, right? It's the way it's defined in Ed Code. That's the end of the fiscal, et cetera, et cetera. So even last year when the deadline was February 2nd, we ran ahead to April 2nd. And then this year, now that it's April 2nd, we went to June 30 just through the end of the school year. But unfortunately, when that trailer bill language came in, and I know we talked about it was signed in the middle of July, maybe the second or third week of July. By the time that information filtered out to us out in the thousand school districts in California, we had already started school as most of us, Gabrielle and I both start kind of second week of August or so. We had really already started school by the time those new ratios came into play when we had been promising our family since January, February, that we would take four-year-old students through June the 30th. So in looking at the calculations and having those students come in and being integrated into classes at the 12 to one or maximum of 24 for two adults ratios, uh, we were right on target uh, for that. Actually, we're below that. I think Gabriella is as well. But when they changed it to 20 to one, and now we have those students that are in those classes and we didn't have the information, that meant two things, right? Gave us a couple of choices. Number one is we can start uh, moving four-year-olds around after they've started the school year in TK, or we can figure out a way to try to address what the issue is and go down, which wasn't really feasible as well, because we have more kids checking in who do have eligible birthdays. So it continues to drive the class sizes up to the 22, 23 area with the two adults. So that really wasn't feasible. So it really just became about looking and saying, okay, how do we work through this and what's the penalty? So uh, for us, we were, our eyes really popped when we realized you get penalized not only per student, but you get penalized for the entire class. Mm. And it's about 55,000 or so for class. So for us, that equates to about a million dollars uh, which is certainly knowing what the budgetary situation is coming would be exacerbated by the decrease in COLA, et cetera, et cetera, and then a million dollars in the wrong direction. So uh, Gabriella's, I know, is, is a much bigger number. Yes, we're about 3.1 million, um, just if nothing had changed. We made some changes to add a third additional adult in the class. So when we went ahead and we did take those early enrollment children through September 1st because we had a two-year timeline. But I did staff it at 18 to 1. The problem is TK numbers are so difficult to predict, just like kindergarten numbers used to be because they haven't been in school before. So we are district-wide average on 45 elementary schools, fairly small schools in a district of 39,000 school uh, students. And um, we have a 3.1 million penalty that really is for a class size average across the district of 21.6. So <clears throat> we staffed at 18 um, students in the class with the two adults, full-time um, potty trained uh, expert um, instructional aid, as well as the TK teacher. But then as the year, as often happens in high poverty and high immigrant population districts, we would have students who were age eligible that came in to register and that one school might have only had one or two TK classes. And so that brought the average up in that one class that had maybe one or two students that were early enrollment. So now we're getting penalized to John's point for one or two students 
and that's a $50,000 penalty. So then you have to balance. So in some classes, we went ahead and brought in some instructional aids. Um, but the reality is you can't just create a new class. And I yeah. do think we're going to see more districts that might not realize they're impacted by this. Not everyone got the memo of the June 30th cutoff changing to June 2nd. And so I think when they get see the audit, they're going to be slapped in the face as we sometimes are by an audit that happens um, post school year. And, and Gabrielle, I'm so I'm so happy that you made mention of the in the TK and the kindergarten. You never really know how many students are going to be there. My wife is a kindergarten teacher, and right now they have two kindergarten classes, but they're having to hire for a um, a K one because they have 18 kindergarten teachers, and and it's only April, and they figure, oh well, we're probably going to have at least two more to get in there. And, uh, but they have to hire for one position knowing full well in a few months, they're going to have to hire, um, for a different position. Folks, if, if you do have questions for, uh, John or Gabriella, go ahead and put those into the chat. We'll tackle some of those, uh, near the end of our broadcast. Gabriella, let me, let me ask both of your districts have a uh, high population of immigrant and low income students. And yet you are outperforming both of your districts outperforming so many, uh, in your respective parts of the state. Uh, but now you're in trouble for doing the good work. Um, what does that say to you, to your staff, to your school community, that you're being punished for your hard work, that you're having some type of um, a punishment for getting these kids into school and, and reacting to what your school community really wants? I'll be frank. John and I have both been in our positions 11 years. We started at the same time as superintendents and um, and we stay in our districts. We're very interested in everything that happens, and I try to avoid the shenanigans, as I call it, that happen at, at the state um, level. However, I cannot avoid these shenanigans because it's kind of adding insult to injury. So we want to have all the TK, but we're only going to do it in this time frame. That's not going to work for high poverty communities and families, because trying to explain to a family why your child was born April 3rd and they can't start and they're going to miss that full year. That's very difficult to do. And we have a high immigrant, high poverty population. So when we looked at the investment that we were just making just in terms of the ADA loss for our district this year is $8.5 million. You add the penalties on top of that and the penalties add insult to injury because this is a element of hypocrisy. I'm trying not to be too upset about it, but the penalties are actually calculated based on ADA. So the better your students attend, the higher your penalty. And that kind of flies in the face of what we're being told about chronic absenteeism. So it's almost like an incentive for TK kids to be chronically absentee, which obviously is an inadvertent consequence. So for us, it's 11.6 million when you take our investment, if we have the penalties and we additionally have the ADA that we're not recouping for those students. Now, the reason we wanted to make that investment of the ADA is because we see, I'm already seeing now, I just was in a TK class, two TK classes yesterday. I'm in them all throughout the week. These kids are reading, writing, doing math, excelling. Our parents are delighted. We actually made a short video to share with state legislators about how happy our parents are about having a, the universal access to TK. But to say that you're not only not going to be paid for them, now you're going to be penalized. And to find out 25 days for us and for John, I think is the same, 25 school business days before that there's added on penalties. And when we found out about the penalties, we didn't even know how much they were until about October. So John and I were actually a meeting together. We're like, TK penalties. Did you hear about those? Yes. How much are they? We don't know. And we didn't even find out about it until actually about Halloween time. And so then you're thinking, so now what do we do? We're certainly not going to send these kids home. And we're certainly not going to disappoint these parents. Mm -hmm. So we are a little livid, I would say. And we just got a good um, question from Jeff in the chat. Thank you. So um, Jeff is asking about the TK staffing ratio for 24-25. Yes, the staffing ratio is 12 to 1. However, if you um, are admitting any children that are after that June 2nd cutoff, that's when the lower ratio kicks in. So I think um, what we're talking about now is the current year. So if any district, you know, Gabriella and John, they both took on district-wide initiatives. They did, you know, massive amounts of enrolling early TK. I think, you know, we also have a lot of concern in Gabriella reference, uh, reference this. There's going to be districts who maybe admitted one or two kids because you had maybe 22 kids in the classroom. You know, we've heard stories about, well, there were, you know, the teacher's children were, you know, four years old and we had space. That one child triggers that, you know, 50 to 60 grand penalty. Mm. 
um, if they're born after June 2nd. So, so yes, 12 to 1 for 24, 25, but you can't enroll early TK students. So that that is the distinction there. Okay. Um, so John, um, can you talk a little bit about the advocacy work that um, we've been doing? Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, Gabriella and I hit the, or Gabriella hit the nail on the head. She and I were, you know, in a meeting a few months ago and just kind of the issue of the TK penalty got brought up. And I think she and I were the only ones that were like, hey, you're on it, you're on it. And then by the time we realized what the penalties were, it was around October uh, and it was a million dollars for us. It was, you know, 3.2 for her. And so we looked and said, we've got to do some work. So really appreciate uh, Megan, the partnership with AXA uh, on this and you and Diana uh, and Edgar and the team really working with us to get in front of legislators. So Gabrielle and I are very fortunate. We have positive relationships with our uh, local legislators. So that's mine right there, Blanca Pacheco, our assembly person. Uh, so we have good relationship with them. So uh, appreciate you and Diana getting us meeting with not not only the legislator themselves, but also their staffers who do a lot of the legwork in relation to this. So on March 19th, those are the pictures of Gabriella and, uh, and me up in uh, Sacramento, uh, we met with a variety of different staffers and legislators themselves that day to really talk about this issue that looking at the reduction of the projected COLA from 3.94% to 0.76% as it stands today, uh, having that impact our revenues for next year, and then something that we had done out of complete good faith, uh, and even as of June 30th of last year, when we went into this starting in January, February, and made these promises and commitments, to our families, uh, that the legislature doing the 180 in regard to the ratios and lowering it from the 24 cap to 20 and the 12 to one to 10 to one for any student who was born after June 2nd, uh, really just mobilized us. And so it was a very productive day on March 19. Really excited about that. And Megan, I'm sure you'll you'll talk a little bit about the, the letter that's being circulated, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but again, really appreciate AXA's partnership and all of you on the Ledge Action team for working with Gabriella and me, because uh, we know it's not just the two of us, that there are many folks out there, even if they may not even be aware, out of good faith did things. And now because of a move in Sacramento after the fact uh, is all of a sudden not okay. So uh, that's the advocacy work continuing to do. I know that you've invited us to come up on April 24th to testify on, uh, I think it's AB 24, uh, 2548, uh, that's being carried uh, by assembly member Tree Ta to come up and talk about this issue because we don't want already projected negative revenues or below projected revenues as a result of the COLA reduction for next year being exacerbated by a penalty that we didn't do anything but good faith, right? Um, and John, you just made mention of it. Um, April 24th, uh, both you and Gabriella are going to be up here uh, testifying um, I, I guess I, I guess what I would like to know, and Gabriella, I'll have you start first, and then John after that. Um, when when you come up here uh, on the twenty fourth, what are you hoping that the legislators hear um, about fixing this problem? Gabrielle, we'll have you start. What we're hoping that they'll hear is that um, we're well run districts and we plan well ahead of time. And so we appreciate the state's concerns, although we feel that there were unanticipated unanticipated consequences of unfairly penalizing districts where free all day preschool or parents don't have the options because of their limited income for paying for preschool um, is a challenge. And so districts who were seeking to just serve students using their own funding were being penalized in a way that I don't think anyone necessarily foresaw with very little advance notice. So what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to waive those penalties for this year um, John and I already have pivoted. We're planning ahead. I'm staffing at like 16 <laughs> in a classroom to prevent it. And um, so that we can cap at 20 um, those classes um, where because we'll be accepting the full year of children. And I could tell you my kindergarten teachers are ecstatic about having next year. Every single kindergartner will have had a full year of transitional kindergarten. So that's what we're hoping. Um, I won't be as um, morally have as much righteous indignation as I'm sharing with my administrator peers, um, but um, just asking them to really contemplate and think about the unanticipated consequences and impact 
on high poverty districts such as ours. Um, John, I'll have you uh, add to it. Yeah, and I, and I would say in addition to what Gabriella said, what, what I want to make sure they know and understand is we acted in good faith at all times, right? So this is just a disconnect between the legislative calendar and the school year calendar. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. We start making commitments to our families in January and February, and this trailer bill wasn't passed until the middle of the third week of July. So there's a real six month kind of disconnect there where we've made commitments to our families based on good faith, based on what is currently in place at that time, knowing what the impact on our districts and then to not have that come to fruition and actually uh, have potential punitive action. Just want them to understand we acted in good faith at all time. And we're just asking for a simple sentence or two in trailer bills that says the penalties are waived for 23, 24. And I mean, if possible, 24, 25, because this is good for our families. Gabriella talked about the unintended consequences. And quite frankly, this is an issue that those of us who have high unduplicated counts, what a great opportunity when you look at learning gaps and the opportunities for students, et cetera. We saw it as a golden opportunity to really do the things that Gabriella referenced uh, much earlier in the conversation and get a head start for our kids, for our families, for our kindergarten teachers, et cetera. Uh, and we just want them to know and understand that this is a good thing. We acted in good faith at all time, and we're just asking them not to penalize us for doing that. It, it is so funny. Every time school leaders make their way up to Sacramento to testify inside the state capitol, it always seems to be the two key words that the two of you both have said, unintended consequences. It's like always uh, that particular thing is you got to get that across to uh, to lawmakers. Dr. John Garcia, superintendent, Downey Unified School District, and Dr. Gabriella Maffi, superintendent, Garden Grove Unified School District. Uh, John, Gabriella, so great to have you here on the show. We look forward to having you back soon. Awesome. Thanks, Nash. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. See you soon. And uh, folks, if you like what you've seen here on the AXA Legislative Lunch Break, we invite you to uh, like us on Facebook or subscribe to us on YouTube. When you do, you'll get instant alerts when we're about to come on with breaking news. And of course, you'll get a reminder when we have our normal Wednesday show coming up. And if you have great stories happening in your school districts, we want to amplify your stories. Go ahead and send your news releases, your photos, your uh, talking points to us uh, for Ed Cal, our great Michelle Carl, our Ed Cal editor mcarl at axa.org. And Megan, I forget to say this almost every single week since we started doing this. We are now available as a podcast, so you get to hear Megan and I audio only. Uh, should you want to, you can download the podcast, a, a number of shows. I believe we have uh, a couple of months worth of shows. You can get that um, on your uh, Apple or Android devices. We know that's exactly how people want to be able to take in the show, Megan, more of us in a completely different format, right? <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't you want that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why wouldn't you want that? Uh, folks, thank you so much for being with us here on the live and interactive AXA legislative lunch break. Remember, we are live and interactive Wednesdays here on AXA Facebook and AXA YouTube. Have a great rest of the day and rest of the week, and we'll see you next time.